Well, this time I've wandered around, searching for the things I've never known. I've been searching for this answer that's only will be found in your love. In my fields, my heart is being mended by your touch. In my heels, your voice has shown my purpose in this world. You have a story from a few of a broken soul. You have a story. for the things I'll never know. Well, it's good to have you here with us as we continue to look at Psalm chapter 23. Uh, we have been looking at verses 1 and 2 so far. Tonight we're going to look at verse 3 of Psalm chapter 23. And as we do so, um, just want to remind you that the Bible is reminding us of the goodness of God and um, how God continues to demonstrate that goodness. Um, this psalm, uh, this verse, uh, church, actually verse 2 and verse 3, are a blessing that God talks about with restoration. Um, he leads me beside quiet waters. Um, and in this verse, verse 3, he restores my soul. Um, he leads me along the path of, of paths to right, uh, the right paths for his namesake. Um, all of this talks about the restoration that God brings to our souls. Um, verse 23, as I learned it in the King James, you know, he restores my soul. He leads me along the righteous pathways or the righteous paths for his namesake. Um, as David writes this, um, he is writing this and, and says, you know, God is the one who restores or renews my life and my soul. And that may seem kind of strange to think about, you know, a Christian needing his soul or her soul to be restored or renewed. Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, as believers, as followers of Christ, um, 
it's very easy in the fallen world in which we live to lose, um, to become downtrodden, to downcast. To, in fact, David in Psalm 42, 11 says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Um, you know, it's, it's really easy as we see the struggles of every day, we battle, we wrestle with the fact that we are not in Eden, we are not at home, but we're in a fallen world with temptation and frustration and hopelessness. Um, it's, it takes a toll. And so what David says is, is that as my life has been taken its toll, God is the one and the only one who can renew that soul. Um, you know, we were, Stacy and I were talking recently about uh, some new teachers um, that are coming up for next year. She mentored teachers, one of them, and she talked about how, you know, this, this person uh, was, you know, some of these, see, some of these new folks, uh, and particularly this one person, was just, just excited and just ready to change the world, and and she and I both said, you know, the, the world hadn't beaten her down yet, or the educational system hadn't beat her down yet, and, and you know, that's, that's why we need our souls to be renewed, because we have been uh, assaulted and beat down, and, and David understood that. Um, David understood that even uh, from the fact that he, his life has been in danger on multiple occasions, um, simply from fo for following the Lord and doing what the Lord called him to do, um, whether it's Saul or whether it's his son, they were always trying to kill him and to take over and take from what the Lord had given to him. Um, and of course, David wasn't perfect as well. David, a lot, some of his his downcast, his soul came from his own doing, um, where you know with Bathsheba and uh, the sin there amongst uh, her and Uriah and. And, and all of that takes place and, and causes his soul to be so downcast. And, you know, I mentioned last week uh, uh, the author of uh, Philip Keller, who has written this book, The Shepherd uh, Trilogy, or this actually The Shepherd Trilogy, three of his books. Uh, a shepherd looks at Psalm 23rd or the 23rd Psalm. A shepherd looks at the good shepherd, and a shepherd looks at the Lamb of God. Um, but the one particular one I'm referring to uh, last week and this week is the shepherd looks at Psalm 23. Keller was a shepherd for eight years, and so the insights that he brings um, as a shepherd helps us kind of understand what's taking place here and what's going on. And as we talk about God renewing our, our my life or restoring my soul, one of the things Keller points out in, in his book is, the idea that that it is to set back right, what he's talking about there is to set back right um, one soul. Um, and, and he uses, again, the sheep and being a shepherd to explain a little bit more about that. And, and, and with the sheep, you know, and caring for the sheep, Keller says that uh, one of the most uh, intimately acquainted uh, with sheep will understand the significance of to be uh, of a cast sheep or a cast down sheep. This is an old English shepherd's term for a sheep that is turned over on its back and cannot get up by itself. And so he goes on and he explains how, you know, a sheep, um, I mean, we can all imagine this, right? A sheep that's, that has rolled over onto its back, his legs are up in the air, and he can't roll back over. He's just laying on his back. And what happens there is as that takes place biologically, uh, that center of gravity moves to the point where he, the sheep can't uh, roll back over. And, and so what takes place there is that blood begins, circulation begins to be cut off to the, to the sheep's extremities. Um, that uh, if the weather is hot or sunny, um, it, it has a hard time cooling itself because of its, its uh, wool and everything else and so uh, we begin to see ammonia and other things building up in its blood system and it actually will end up dying um, laying on its back because it cannot get out of that position it's not a position of survival it's a position of death and so what the shepherd will do uh, Keller says is that he'll was he watches over his sheep he will see a sheep that has become downcast or 
has become cast or cast down and and, and he'll he'll roll them back over uh, but then he won't just roll them back over because again what's happened is is that uh, the circulation in the sheep's legs have, have stopped and stuff like that and so the shepherd will actually sit there and hold the sheep and rub and massage his legs and 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 talk quietly and gently to the sheep to restore the circulation um, back into the sheep's uh, extremities so that the sheep is able to continue on. Um, he says why he, he gives us a reason why the sheep, why this happens. Um, he said that uh, the sheep um, will become downcast um, really for uh, several different reasons. Um, the first is, is that um, the, the sheep has become just too fat. Um, the sheep has uh, has eaten too well, has become too fast, and so because of its weight, it cannot shift over or roll over. Another kind of along those same lines is the sheep, um, the 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 wool of the sheep has become uh, matted and muddy and has uh, manure and furs and debris in it, and and it's become heavy, and because of that, the weight uh, holds down or keeps the sheep from rolling back over and, and and you know if you think about it um you know uh, and third way or third reason is that they will find a, a soft spot a hole and as they get into that hole to, to to kind of bring about comfort they'll lie down and then because of uh the fact of their weight or the their their being overweight or that there's too much wool then they'll actually uh, roll back over onto their back and, and get into this cast system and cast down castness. Um, and so, you know, Keller relates this to, to the believer. Um, he says, first of all, the sheep choose comfort, soft, rounding hollows in the ground in which to lie uh, down, often become cast. In such a situation, it's easy to roll over on our back. In the Christian life, there's great danger and always looking for the easy place, the cozy corner, the comfortable position where there is no hardship, no need for endurance, no demand upon self-discipline. You know, I was talking with somebody just the other day about the fact that, you know, within the church, one of the things that we see today is that um, that we worship idols. And, and, you know, we may not be, a, it's not a stone idol that we go and kneel down before, but but what are some idols that we see in our church and, and in our churches uh, and in our culture today? And uh, one of them is uh, the idol of comfort. Um, we don't, nobody wants to be, uh, nobody likes pain. Nobody enjoys pain uh, if they're of sound mind. Uh, you know, we, we try to avoid pain. Uh, but oftentimes because of that, our desire to, to feel no suffering, to have no struggles, to just uh, have a, a peaceful life, that peaceful life becomes every, our, our goal, our God, and everything that we do dedicates us to that. And, and so if God calls us to do something which is hard and difficult and we may have suffering, we won't do it because why? It affects our comfort. Um, and so that's what we see here with the soul becomes downcast or not you know the the soul is 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 not in that right place with God is because we've desired and loved our comfort more than we have the shepherd. He also says the about the wool I mentioned earlier that you know the wool has become weighted down, and he says for a Christian, um, wool in Scripture depicts the this, the uh, depicts the old life uh, for the believer. Uh, it's the idea that. Uh, we're clinging to the accumulation of things or possessions or worldly ideas, and they begin to weigh us down. They begin to drag us down. They begin to hold us down. They become a heavy weight. That's why Jesus said, you know, cast all of your burdens upon me, and I will give you rest. Why? Because the idea of, of selfishness and pride uh, and, 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 and trying to do things ourselves holds us down and weighs us down. You know, in fact, it's it's kind of significant that when the high priest were uh, uh, would go into the holy of holies, um, the high priest was not allowed to wear wool. 
Why? Because wool in the Old Testament spoke of self, of pride, of personal preference. And God would not tolerate that. Likewise, for the believer, uh, we are weighted down by our own pride, our own selfishness, our own personal preference. And because of that weight, it destroys our soul. It casts our soul down. And only God can restore it. I also mentioned the fact of being the sheep being overweight. Um, their weight uh, makes it harder for them to be agile and nimble on their on their feet. Um, and uh, you know, he goes on to Keller goes on to say, of course, once a shepherd man, even, shepherd man even or shepherd even suspects that his sheep are becoming cast for the reason of being overweight, he will take long range steps to correct the problem. He will put the the uh, sheep on a more rigorous uh, ration. Uh, they will eat uh, less grain, uh, and the general condition of the flock will be watched closely. Uh, it is his aim to see that the sheep are strong and sturdy and energetic, not flabby, uh, fat, or weak. And then he goes on and says that for the believer, we are confronted with the same sort of problem. There are men and women who become, because they have done well in business or in their careers or their homes, feel that they have flourished and have arrived. Uh, they have a sense of well-being, of self-assurance, which is in itself dangerous. You know, have you ever felt like, well, I've arrived. Hey, I've reached this high level of, of spirituality. I am there. Uh, well, that is like the person who is the sheep that is overweight and has rolled over on his back. Um, Jesus even talks about this in the parable of the wealthy farmer who intends to build bigger and bigger barns, but in fact, face utter ruin he died that very night you see our, our material success is no measure of our spiritual success or spiritual health um, you know if we have a, uh, a see the fact that uh, uh, you know we oh I, I don't need to study the word why because I know it well that's a that's not a spiritually healthy thing that's where we've become full of ourselves and we've become overweight and we can become downcast so he says, you know, God renews or restores our downcast life. Uh, he, then he says, he leads me along the right paths or the righteous paths for his namesake. Um, this, this blessing here, this third blessing is that God not only restores us, but thirdly, he also gives us the right path to walk down or the path of righteousness. Um, you know, it's, it's no, it's no, coincidence that in scripture people are called sheep uh, referred to as sheep um, here even in Psalm 23 if God is the shepherd who is the sheep we are um, we are all stiff-necked stubborn people um, we've gone astray we've gone down the wrong road Isaiah 53 6 says we are all like sheep have gone astray each of us have turned his own way you know everyone today wants to go down their own path they want to write their own life story but but the reality is is the Bible says that, that there's only one true right way. Um, there's only one right way. We've gotten into this habit, this belief in our culture. Uh, of It's kind of an offset of the idea that all roads lead to heaven. Well, the we know that's not true. And likewise, the newest one is that all roads lead to your own truth or to truth. Uh, but, but yet it's your truth or so-and-so's truth, but it's not the truth. Um, just because you're on the a path doesn't make you're on mean you're on the right path. Um, that path that you're on can lead you down uh, into gullies or to dangers or to death. Um, you know, we read in Psalm fourteen twelve and uh, excuse me, Proverbs fourteen twelve and Proverbs four, uh, sixteen twenty five. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to what death. Um, you know, the good shepherd says. I bring you life, and I want you to follow me on the right path. You know, we are a people who like to be in charge and direct our own steps. But the Bible reminds us that God, as the good shepherd, leads us down the path of righteousness or the right path, the right way. And if we're not following him, then just like um, truth is only defined by God, uh, and if it's not defined by God, it's not true. A path that is not led by God 
is not at the right path. How sad it would be for many people. That's why Jesus even mentions and says uh, in the gospel, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Um, you know, he said, then goes on and says, you know, some preached or prophesied in my name, some cast out demons and healed. What, you know, what he's referring to there is folks who are going down the path that they thought led to righteousness or to rightness with God, and it turned out to be wrong. What path are you on? Are you on the right path? And you say, well, how do you know if you're on the right path? Well, you, it's the path that God has laid out for us in Jesus Christ. So the very first path, the first step of that path is, is asking ourselves, do we know Jesus? Do we have a right and personal relationship with him? Have we, had a, have we been forgiven of our sin? And is Christ's righteousness become my righteousness? Because my righteousness is in Christ. You know, although we prefer to turn um, and take our path of our own path, our own right, our own way, it only leads to death and to destruction. Well, next week we're going to continue to look at this uh, passages of, uh, of uh, Psalm 23. We're going to look at Psalm 23, verse 4, and uh, hope that Sunday morning we'll see you uh, and join us for worship at uh, 1030, uh, or also uh, Bible study at 915 Sunday morning. Also, don't forget this Sunday you're going to be doing our uh, uh, after church uh, hamburger supper or hamburger lunch to go for our children's camp. So if you're interested and want a good hamburger or multiple hamburgers, uh, the price is just simply a donation. And if you don't have money to do that, that's fine. Get you a hamburger anyway. We'll have plenty. So hope that you'll join us, invite somebody, bring somebody with you, and we'll see you next week.